How's it going everybody? I hope you're having a good week. Today's task is gonna be replacing a vapor line service valve on this rude condenser behind me here. Uh, I'm in the Nashville area and about two weeks ago we had a tornado come through and this condenser actually got flipped upside down and it twisted the copper line right at that service valve. Um, so what I'm gonna do is go ahead and remove the existing valve itself, repair any kink lines, and then put the new valve in and go from there. So if you're new to the channel, my name is Zach and I'm an owner and operator of an HVAC company out of Tennessee. Uh, on this channel, I try to cover installs, repairs, maintenances, anything that has to do with heating and air conditioning. So if you guys are interested in that and you're not subscribed already, consider doing so. If you guys are also interested in supporting the channel, you can become a patron. I'll leave a link down in the description below. All right, so the first thing I need to do is recover all the refrigerant out of the system so I can remove that valve. Let's do some work. As you can see here, the vapor line valve is just completely twisted up. So with my recovery process, normally I hook up to both high side and the low side service valves and then go directly to the recovery machine. But today I'm gonna try something a little different. I've got some Appian larger inner diameter hoses here that has a quarter inch on one side and a three eighths on the other. So what I'm gonna do is hook up the quarter inch side to the core removal tool on the suction line service valve. And then on this 3 8 side, I'm gonna connect it directly to this 3 8 filter dryer that I've got reduced down a quarter inch so we can connect to the recovery machine. So that way I'm filtering the refrigerant before it goes in the machine, keeps the machine clean. And then on the output side of the recovery machine, I've got a quarter to quarter hose with a, uh, this is a bigger diameter. I think it's a 3 8 diameter hose quarter inch connections on each side. So I can connect to the output of the, of the recovery machine and then directly to the uh, recovery tank. We got about roughly around six to six and a half pounds of refrigerant to recover. Um, today it's about seven, 65, 70 degrees out. And let's see how long this takes to recover the refrigerant. And as far as the connection on the recovery tank itself, what I like to do is hook it up to the vapor side and then turn the tank upside down. That seems to help the recovery process as well. I don't really like the way this 45 is making it shoot out, so I'm gonna go ahead and remove that. That way it kind of comes just straight down and it's probably less stress on this fitting. So I'm gonna go ahead and do that now. All right, so I've got that reconfigured the way I like it. That looks a lot better to me. Um, I went ahead and purged all the air out of the lines all the way up to the tank. So I'm ready to go ahead and turn this thing on. We are finished up and we are right at 14 minutes. Throw that out. The tear weight of the tank was 17 pounds and we are showing 23 and a half pounds. So five and a half pounds. All right, now that I've got the refrigerant recovered, I am good to start dismantling the unit and getting this valve changed out. <laughs> So I was able to remove this side panel as one piece. All the electrical is intact, except for the condenser fan motor. I gotta do a little bit of cleaning up, but as you can see, that valve got twisted up very good. As you can probably hear a lot of the background noise, uh, there's a lot of people working out here today. And they have been working out here. 
trying to get Nashville all cleaned up. Uh, there's tons of just debris all over the place. You got houses with blue tarps pretty much on every house on this street. Um, houses are just torn apart, cars that are torn apart. Um, it's just a real tragedy to see this. All right, so I got everything cut out. I'm gonna go ahead and unbraze this valve. So to protect the new valve when brazing, we don't want to overheat it. So I picked up some of this solder weld hot block. Uh, basically, it's way better than a, just a generic wet rag, as in it's reusable and you can form it perfectly around the valve or whatever you're trying to protect. Um, and you just add a little bit of water to it if you need to, to get the consistency the way you want it. Other than that, you just get you a handful of it and just kind of form it the way you want to around the valve itself. There we go. Now that it's in place, I can go ahead and take the heat block and form it around the valve. What that's gonna do is help us block the burn, baby. Block the burn. Yeah, this, the consistency is really nice. It just it stays where you where you put it, and I'm I'm generous with it. I don't I don't mess around. I, I make sure it's nice and covered because again, it's reusable. So it's not like you're gonna throw it away once you're done. I'm gonna go ahead and get this unit turned the way it's supposed to be. Get everything piped in, and that way I can hook up the nitrogen, get it flowing, and embrace everything at one time. So when you're dealing with copper refrigeration, piping preparation is key. So uh, cleaning the pipe, deburring the pipe, you don't want to bypass any of these steps. You want to make sure you do a good thorough job before you even start brazing. So I've already cleaned the pipe, now I'm going to go ahead and deburr it and then I'll be ready to do the uh, liquid line. All right, so I already got the liquid line dryer. Uh, piped in, everything is clean, deburred, ready to go. So I've got the uh, nitrogen tank hooked up, so I'm ready to start purging and get everything brazed in. So my preferred um, brazing rod is solder welds. They're 15%. I really like these. This is a round rod and this stuff flows very well. I've used the standard flat bars from the other companies for the longest time, but when I switched over to solder weld, I could really tell the difference on how well it flows around the joint. It seems like it does a lot better job than the standard 15% um, that you would see in the market now. Let's get it to brace. There we go. So that went smooth, no problems at all, just the way I like it. I'm gonna go ahead and let this thing cool down for a few minutes before I remove that hot block, drink some water, get a snack, and then I'll get ready to put this thing on a pressure test. I really wanna show you how happy I am with this product. Solder Weld is a phenomenal product. These 15% rod, round rods and the hot block, and when you pair these things together, they just work. So I cannot recommend these enough, guys. Um, this is not a sponsored video by Solder Weld. I'm not saying that it can't be, but this is a great product. Um, I stand behind it and this is the reason why I wanted to shoot this video today using these products because this is a common repair all the time in the field. Um, I'm telling you, these round rods are phenomenal. I don't know what Solder Weld does differently with their rods, but man, does it flow well. It's just, it seems like it adheres to the pipe a lot better um, and then using the hot block as well. Between these two things, guys, I highly recommend them. And as always, I'm gonna be linking all the products and the tools that I use down in the description. True Tech Tools is a good place to get solder weld. Um, uh, there's a, a discount code that I'll put down there for you that a friend of mine has and um, you know save you some money there. But 
yeah, truetechtools.com would be the best place to go. If you cannot find it locally, if you can't find it locally, tell you guys at the counter to bring in solder weld. Um, trust me, once you use it once, you'll never go back. I also wanted to show you what you get if you do order this kit here. Uh, and this is the kit that I would recommend getting for your truck because it comes with this nice waterproof cylinder. So yeah, if you're brazing copper to brass, copper to copper, aluminum to copper, or just aluminum, this whole kit takes care of everything you need. And it's nice to have everything with you on the truck in a nice waterproof uh, cylinder like this, you know, and it's a plus that you can, you know, hang it on something as well. But um, such a simple thing that um, I find to be pretty awesome to have the cylinder where all your rods are in one place and you just grab it off the truck and go and uh, take care of whatever you need to take care of. All right, so I got both Appian Core removal tools connected. One side has just a field piece probe for pressurizing. And then, um, cause I don't like to use manifolds or, or any extra hoses when I'm pressure testing. I wanna make sure I eliminate any possible leaks. So after I get the pressure up to where I want it, I actually valve off this core tool and then remove the hose and put a cap on there. And then that way the only thing connected is just that probe. Design pressure on the high side is 550 and the low side is 250. So I'm gonna, and it's a 410A system. So I'm gonna go ahead and pressurize the 500. I think that'll be good enough. All right, so I'm gonna go ahead and remove these core removal tools. I use these specifically for uh, refrigerant handling. So when I'm recovering refrigerant, I'll use those core tools. Um, and then when I'm evacuating, pulling a vacuum, I have a separate set of core tools for that. That way I don't, I keep all my vacuum stuff nice and dry and clean. Um, and a different set of hoses for evacuation, different set of core tools as well. So as you can see, we are one minute in. We're already down to 12,000 microns. And again, this is a little two CFM battery operated pump. This hose set is what's really gonna make this vacuum process a lot faster, not necessarily the CFM of the pump. It's having the right process using the core tools Removing the cores, no manifold, and having this three-quarter inch inner diameter hose going straight to the pump. All right, so our vacuum is good. It is holding the decay test with well. I'm gonna go ahead and remove the hoses and weigh the uh, charge back into the system. Should be ready to start it up. I'm gonna let this thing run for another 15 or 20 minutes, let everything equalize out, get the superheat, subcooling where it needs to be. I do have an indoor TXV on this one, so I'll be charging the subcooling. Um, right now we're looking pretty good. Let's give it a little bit more time to make sure we're good to go. And uh, I'm just gonna get everything cleaned up and that should wrap up the video for today. I hope you guys really enjoyed this process. If you have any questions about how I did it or the tools that I used, like always, leave your comments down below. Really appreciate you guys watching, and until next time, we'll see you later.